Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And I'm so glad you're joining me tonight for part two of our story. It's so good that you're tuning in. And don't forget to go and get that fabulous drink. And if it's something unusual, let me know about it. Because some of you do drink some quite unusual stuff. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Beryl's account. I'd been ever so excited, waiting to tell my husband and daughter my brilliant, stupendous news. I admit, it was late in the day. But did that matter? Of course it didn't. My 15-year-old daughter, Samantha, had longed for a baby sister or brother all her life. My husband had been bitterly disappointed that we weren't able to have any more children. A visit to the doctor had affirmed this appalling revelation. The gravity of its momentous implications and dreadful consequences weighed so heavily on my heart for many long years. I'll never forget the bitter disappointment in my husband's eyes as he gave me a thin, watery smile that did so little to conceal the melancholia that had audaciously seeped through his pores. It was so tangible, even the doctor felt it. While I felt a rising level of guilt, compounded by the limp bedraggled confetti of my own personal failings as a woman. I had ineffaciously failed my husband, along with my beloved three-year-old daughter Samantha, who was longing for a little brother or sister to play with. She begged me for one. I had let them both down, which made me feel as deflated as a popped birthday party balloon that had run out of air and emotionally bankrupt. How my husband longed for a big family. We had talked about it often enough before we actually got married. Now our hopes were dashed, like fragile pottery being flung violently against the rocks, shattered into smithereens. No amount of providential dreaming was going to change the trajectory of our infelicious bleak situation that stared back at us brazenly, like a blank piece of paper that invited no hope of little feet or hands to be imprinted on its pages in a bright blue paint to mark the arrival of another little one in our lives. No, that just wasn't going to happen. The hopelessness of our plight was profound. The doctor looked exceedingly uncomfortable. I almost felt sorry for him. It couldn't be easy dealing with the defeated, vanquished souls whose hopes clung on to your every word. He had cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> It's not all bad news, Mr. Greenberg. There are ways you can have other children. I know there are many unmarried mothers out there who are taken to secret locations to have their children that are given up over to adoption. You know the stigma of having a baby out of wedlock these days. There are many of these children longing for new homes that would gladly welcome being adopted. I can put you in touch with such places help you navigate your way around the adoption process. My husband stiffened, his back straightened, his eyes almost glared at the doctor, as if his words had created great offence. I remember he almost growled his disdain. I don't want to adopt anybody else's children, Dr. Bollinger. I want my own children, nobody else's. Are you sure you're right about my wife? Could you not just be mistaken? I am quite sure, Mr. Greenberg, your wife is not capable of having any more children. At this, the doctor went through the scientific reasons as to why I could not conceive that were impossible to understand for a simpleton like myself, who knew about as much about biology and science as a mammal in the woodgrove. For much like them, my knowledge was instinctively driven. I naturally took the doctor at his word. Why would I doubt him? My burdened, heavy heart left his surgery, not the same as the way I had entered it. It was now condemned to an unavailing, unproductive life sentence of impuissant, impotent dreams that would never, ever be germinated or come into fruition. Some things are not easy to hear. You might think the sound of a demolition site bringing down a building into a crumbling, explosive heap is a sound that is tough on the ears, but nothing was worse 
than the ear-splitting screams in my heart that were so loud they were deafening. I knew that the life me and my husband had dreamed of, raising a handful of children, was not to be. Let's just say I felt as uselessly feeble and as washed up as the seaweed on the beach. By all accounts, accepting my lot was not easy to do. I loathed being in the company of other pregnant mothers who gloated about the third child on the way, and many asked me why I was not having a little one for Samantha to play with. You know, you should have a little brother or sister for Samantha, I was continuously told by well-meaning friends of mine. Having one kid is not enough. Children need siblings, don't they? And besides, if you only have one kid, they end up becoming quite spoilt and can be quite obnoxious at times. Now, my mother's friend only had one daughter. She turned out to be a self-entitled little kid. They would garrulously go on and on at me. For a moment, my mind would just slip away from the conversation, melting into the clouds, until one of the mothers would say, Beryl! Beryl, are you listening? Sorry, what was that you were saying? I'd say. The mothers would exchange strange looks between each other. You were miles away, Beryl, basking on another planet. We were talking about you having a little one for Samantha. If it happens, it happens, I'd say. I was not going to indulge my friend with the clandestine issues I was dealing with in my own heart. I was raised in a time when some things weren't openly discussed, and it served you well to keep a stiff upper lip. Indeed, even if I had grown up in a generation more open about contentious personal issues such as my own, I doubt I would have been keen to share the troubles that were eating away at me from the inside with anybody else. I wanted nothing more for my daughter to have a sister or brother, but I wasn't going to share my feelings with anyone. I remember it was in the May of 1948 that I found I was pregnant. Even before I visited the doctor, I knew it. I experienced many of the exact same symptoms I had gone through when I was pregnant with Samantha. The same extreme aversion to coffee or rich sauces or heavy dishes, or even the smell of cleaning products. So when I returned home from the doctors, to tell Samantha and my husband over dinner the great news. I had never anticipated, not even for a single moment, that they would react so adversely. I had assumed that they would feel as delighted about my news as they would have done ten years ago. But things had changed exponentially. The dynamics in our household had dramatically shifted. My husband had moved on. His dreams of a new addition to the family had long since been expunged. He wanted different things now. The announcement of my baby had set a cat among the pigeons. The reaction on my husband's face had been one of undisguised horror. While my daughter had looked quite stunned, as if she'd been shocked by several volts of electricity. The cloying, unsettling silence that evening marked the air with the screams of their disappointment. I realised in that moment that my great news was most unwelcome. Feeling chagrined, deeply affronted, I had stormed belligerently out of the house, as the apoplectic hurt had scorched me, like the red-hot water from a boiled kettle being flung violently over my skin. The emotional hurt was scorching. It was excruciatingly physical. I wanted to scream in inflamed indignation. Why are you being like this? I don't understand. Why? We wanted this. We wanted this. I had wanted to yell at my husband, but the words were not forthcoming. There was a big lump at the back of my throat. I think I did unleash a few unbridled scant words, of which I had no memory, but I'm sure they weren't kind. The journey from the entrance to the front door, finally to the carport, and to my husband's pristine Cadillac, was bleary, as my tears obscured my visibility, making everything nebulously indeterminate while the heavy rain clouds of my despair were unrelenting as they pounded down my face like a foggy rain shower. I found myself driving down the long back country roads of the Kentucky countryside, driving through a maze of my own confusion. I tried desperately not to think as my undulating emotions drifted between anger, disappointment, to sorrowful self-pity. The night was congenial, very welcoming. The velvety dark sky was flooded with the magnanimous moonlight that meant that much of the road was washed in this ethereal illumination, while the stars seemed to glow with a brightness I had never seen before, 
like buffed-up diamonds gleaming from a polishing. The oak and maple trees on the sturdy embankments that fringed either side of the road were ambiguously vague, like dense overhanging thick black shadows. Their clandestinely obscure forms seemed to offer me an idiosyncratic form of comfort on this night. It was like the natural world herself hugged me with a reassuring peace, a warm comfort that my husband and daughter had both failed to offer me. It was like even the warm-hearted trees that jiggled against a still breeze could sense my melaconia and were bountifully commiserating with me. I pull the Cadillac to one side of the road and park it. I decide to walk in the fresh air, surrounded by the statuesque imposing trees, down this long windy road without a single soul in sight was exactly what I needed to lift my spirits, to energise my flagging heart. I'm not exactly wearing the most appropriate shoes, as my flat-heeled pumps do not accommodate the stones and pebbles on the road very easily. But I don't care. I walk down the road, slowly, steadily exercising a wary caution. I didn't want to trip and lose my footing, and this road knew not the meaning of the word smooth. My tears have dried up. My nose is smelling the earthen pleasantries of the landscape sometimes picking up a fragrant floral infusion in the air that I cannot identify, but it's very pleasing. The soft breeze is nuzzling my cheeks. Before long the tears trickle down my face again. I climb up the embankment and sit underneath an old, very crooked oak tree that probably looks just like how I feel, with my arms holding my knees to my chest. I stare out blankly into the night, trying to empty my mind of its nagging doubts that I do not desire to engage. The large size of its huge outstretched leafy boughs, now bursting with fresh new leaves, shelters me like a generous umbrella. For a long time I stare out at the night, my eyes adjusting to the dark shadows. I can hear the night is shrill, with the pretty pleasing sounds of crickets and frogs, and in this space I am so aware of how small and minuscule my problems are in the grand scheme of things. It's amazing how nature does that to you. Indeed, she could be swallowed whole by the natural world, like a rustling leaf blowing on the wind, and who knows where it's going to get to in the end. And that is when I see her. She moves towards me, almost floating in the moonlight, as it washes her long flowing hair in its gentle illumination. She is majestic, lofty, robust in size and weight. And yet despite her intimidating repose, there is something so kind in her demeanour. I should be intimidated, daunted by her marvellous great size. I should shrink away in terror, making a hasty retreat back to my car. But I do not do that. I unflinchingly remain seated, as this incredible creature moves towards me, seating herself down next to me, only a foot away from where I am sitting. She adopts exactly the same posture as me almost as if she's mimicking me, with her overlong arms draped over her knees, pulled closely to her chest. We say nothing, as we both stare out at the night, and her unassuming presence appears to offer me so much comfort. I have never met anyone like her before. She looks human, but she's not. I mean, how can she possibly be? She's covered in hair. Her head shape is more arched, but her face is unequivocally human and it's her face and those kind, caring, deep-set dark eyes that make me fully aware that I'm in the presence of a friend. I begin to talk to her, as she is just so easy to talk to. I've never felt as free to talk to anyone in my life so openly, but something about her manner makes talking to her seem like the most natural thing in the world, and for my generation, talking openly like this was never easy. I pat my belly as I look at her, it's not fair, I blubber. Not fair. Do you know how long I've been wanting to have another baby? When me and my husband, we got together all those years ago, we'd sit on the haystack, dreaming about how many kids we wanted to have together. My husband said we'd have seven. I remember being shocked at first, but I came around to his idea. I fancied seven children in the end. We had our first child, and then we tried for another. But nothing happened. And then I was told by the doctor that I'd never be able to have more children. But now, now I'm pregnant again. 
The creature's eyes are focused on me. I know she can understand my words, but she seems to read my thoughts. She nods at me, points at herself and her belly, raising one finger. You have one child, I ask her. She nods. Girl, I ask. She shakes her head. Boy, I ask. She nods. I am confounded. She seems to understand me. I continue. Well, I went to see the doctor. He told me I couldn't have any children. I was so sad. My husband, he was devastated. He tried not to show it, but I could see his dream of having seven kids had gone right down the plug hole. I felt like I'd failed him and my daughter too, but there was nothing I could do at the time. The doctor told my husband he should consider adopting. I even tried to persuade him that adoption might not be such a bad idea. But my husband didn't want to be raising somebody else's child. He wanted the baby to be his. So we settled for our lot. You know how you do. You just have to accept what it is. I mean, what choice did we have? Well, it's been 15 years. Now I discover I'm pregnant. I'm past my first trimester. I couldn't wait to tell my husband and daughter the great news. But were they pleased? No, not at all. They weren't pleased at all. I burst into tears. They spill down my face while the hairy lady begins to pat my back. She moves close to me, and I can smell the dust on her shining black hair. It's such a reassuring smell. She smells of the earth. I look up at the creature. Her eyes meet mine. She points at my belly. I hear the words in my head. You're having a boy. It's a gift. I'm having a boy, I say, looking at her befuddled. But how do you know that? The energy. The energy, she says. I look at the hairy woman nonplussed. Her eyes shine into mine. I hear the words in her head. Give them time. They'll soon delight in your news. Just you wait and see. The strange creature watches me. I thank her. I climb back into my husband's Cadillac and make the journey back home. My heart filled with a renewed peace that even I could not fathom. But I knew the peace came from that incredible creature that I had spent some time with. Errol's account. My wife's news that she was having a baby hit me grievously hard. I'm not going to lie. There was a time in my life I'd embraced the idea of having a large family, but that dream wilted away when I realized its foundations had no enduring roots. It was like having a tree in your yard that you cut down and you plant a different tree in its place and this one wants different things to the one you cut down. I no longer hankered after the former visions I had for my life. At 48 years old, I was embarking on a different journey. I was comfortably settled into family life, very happy. I adored my daughter Samantha, and she was enough for me, more than enough. My wife's announcement had thrown a spanner in the works, as I no longer wanted a baby. Of course, when she returned back from her drive in the Cadillac, I noticed she did not seem as despondent as she had seen before. There was a peace to her that I couldn't fathom. The drive seemed to have done her the world of good. I was ever thankful that my Cadillac still remained in one piece, as my wife was not the most fastidious driver at the very best of times. Of course, what could I do? I naturally took her into my arms. I told her, I'm so thrilled with the news, darling. I'm very excited about our new child. I'm looking forward to becoming a father. Are you really? Do you mean that? Of course I mean that. I'm very excited. I lied through my teeth. So did my daughter. We didn't want to upset my wife, especially now that she was beyond the first trimester. I mean, we couldn't do that to her, could we? Me and my daughter Samantha knew we were going to have to weather the storm, and come what may, we were going to have to come around to the idea of a new addition to our home. A screaming baby, dirty nappies and the whole shenanigans that having a baby entails. Still, it couldn't be helped. My wife was thrilled that we seemed to have changed our minds about the baby. It was a shock, that's all I told her. But we're thrilled with the news. We couldn't be happier. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm relieved, you know. I'm wondering what we should actually call him. How do you know it's a boy? Oh, I got the information from a rather reliable source. I trust her most implicitly. Suffice to say, 
One night when I lay fast asleep in my bed, I had a lucid dream. It was so vivid that I could remember all the details. My dreams are more commonly ambiguous, shrouded by the veil of obscurity. I don't know how other people dream, so I don't have any basis of comparison. But let's just say most of my dreams are so indeterminate, so foggy, caught up in a nebulous, blurry haze, that I gain an impression from them, more than see the definitive details. So this dream was paradoxical. I could see this tall, dark, gigantic figure of a woman, covered in long, flowing hair, with an arched head, and deep-set, dark eyes that gave off a yellow eye shine. She spoke to me in my dream. You're having a boy. His name is Eastman. Be proud of your gift. Be kind to your wife. Be grateful to your God. I sat up with a start, the sweat pouring down my face, as I pondered how my dream could have been so vivid. I looked up at the meaning of the name Eastman, and it said, Grace Protector and Nature Lover. Six months later, when my wife's waters broke, and she made that ominous trip to the hospital, I was surprised by the excited feelings that were churning away in my stomach. It twisted and tangled up in knots. We were having a baby. I hadn't wanted a baby, but suddenly it was as if every single cell in my body was doing a happy dance. Of course, in those days, we weren't invited to watch the baby being born, and I'm ever thankful for small mercies, as the sight of the birthing process would have been very daunting and not something I wanted to physically endure. Suffice to say, waiting for my wife to give birth to the baby seemed to last an entire lifetime. The midwife would often leave the delivery room to give me updates. Mr. Greenberg, your wife's doing remarkably well. It won't be long now. Things are looking up. I could then hear the sound of a baby crying, and the midwife, she burst out of the room with a huge smile on her face. Congratulations, Mr. Greenberg. You've just had a baby boy. Seven pounds, two ounces. He's absolutely gorgeous. You're going to love him. I was led into the room with my wife sitting on the bed, smiling like a Cheshire cat. She was so happy. But she couldn't have been as happy as I was, because the smile on my face was so large, it could almost have jumped off. She was rocking the baby in her arms, wrapped in a blue blanket she had purchased four months in her pregnancy, as she knew the baby was a boy, from a reliable source, she told me, of which she refused to disclose, saying to me, That night when I went out in the Cadillac, do you remember? I met a hairy angel. She changed my heart. Hairy angel, I thought. Chance would be a fine thing. But I didn't probe her any further. What are we going to call him? I asked her. She looked at me with a big grin and said, His name is Eastman. I was naturally confounded, as I recalled my vivid dream. Where on earth did she get that name from? Where did you get that name from? I asked her. I don't know. It just came to me one night, and then I looked up its meaning. It means protector of grace, lover of nature. I thought it was a great name. Some things are clearly meant to be. Eastman it is, I said. It was in the May of 1948, when my baby son was about six months old, that I was taking care of our baby, having left his pram on the wraparound porch. My wife had gone off to her poetry class and was thoroughly enjoying writing poems. She was even more inspired after the serendipitous birth of her son that had sparked her creativity exponentially, and she was writing some good stuff that certainly impressed me, and I'm not easy to impress at the very best of times. I think she thoroughly enjoyed expressing herself, having come from a decidedly reserved, rather reticent, stiff upper lip background, where children were expected to be seen but not heard, and the freedom of expression was not encouraged while any emotional outpouring was almost offensive and certainly inappropriate. My wife had made so many new friends in the poetry class, enjoying her new creative outlet, almost as if her clipped wings had finally grown back and she was able to fly again. I had taken the afternoon off to look after my son. Little Eastman, whom had become the apple of my eye, it was hard to even comprehend that there had been a time when I would have happily rejected this little bundle of joy. Now I could not envisage living without him. It's funny how much more resilient we are at adapting to change than we may think we are, and it's not as intimidating as it first appears. 
Indeed, spontaneous, serendipitous changes can breathe new life into our hearts, changing the trajectory of our lives. Even my now 16-year-old daughter, Samantha, was beguiled by her little brother. Her former reservations about having a baby brother had been abandoned. She'd look for any opportunity to take him for a stroll in his pram. Eastman was a very happy baby. He was beautiful too. And on this fabulous spring morning, my favourite time of the year, the squirrels and raccoons had come out of hibernation. The bird's song was more rich in its vibrancy, while the eastward budwood trees were bursting with purple blossoms. The dogwoods and saucer magnolias were putting on a showy display. A soft sunshine was filtering through the sky, casting its sunny rays across our wraparound porch. By all accounts, we and my family were incredibly lucky to live in such a prepossessing part of Kentucky. Our farmhouse was nestled in a hilly, verdant valley, bespeckled generously with statuesque trees. On the side of our property facing the long, windy road was a sumptuous woodland oasis that stretched out for miles, having overtaken much of the land there. Let's just say, the prepossessing views in our part of the world are always spectacular. And let me not harp on about some of those Kentucky sunsets. They really are extraordinary. Skies ablaze, in rich resplendent oceans of orange, tangerine, gold and pink, that would make the hardest heart melt like butter. Our baby was thankfully fast asleep in his pram, his little eyes shut, his body swathed in a lightweight cotton blanket. So I used this quintessential golden opportunity to retreat indoors to get a lemonade along with a book for myself to read. When I returned to the wraparound porch, I got the shock of my life. Standing there on the porch was a large, humongous figure. The figure I'd seen in my dream so clearly that it told me my son was to be called Eastman. I am so dumbfounded that the lemonade slips out of my hand as ice and broken glass shatter across the ground, breaking into thousands of shards. This extraordinary, idiosyncratic creature, the likes of such I have never seen before, is looking at me with a wizened but benevolent kind expression on her face. But what is she? I'd say she was human, as her face was like yours or mine. But her body was so huge and covered in long flowing hair, the colour of dark coal. She has small pert breasts, and a very obvious female energy. She was rocking our baby in its pram backwards and forwards, and little Eastman was chuckling happily, looking up at her adoringly, in a way I'd never seen him look at anyone before, not even his own mother. I was almost jealous of that look. I didn't know how to react. I mean, how do you react when you see a kindly presence on your porch rocking your baby backwards and forwards? I knew she was no threat despite her intimidating, rather daunting sighs. She looks up at me with those beautiful eyes, and I hear the words in my head. I came to check on little Eastman. She puts a little river stone on the porch table, gives me a nod, and glides away. I remember thinking, bloody hell, what was that? And I picked up the river stone to observe it. It was a rather attractive stone, one like I'd never seen before, so I decided to keep it. I knew better than to tell my wife about our strange visitor, as I just knew such a revelation might cause her undue stress. Oh, by the way, darling, a huge hairy creature covered in hair, bigger than a bear, came on to our wraparound porch while you were away in your poetry class, and was rocking our baby backwards and forwards. Very, very sweet creature. My wife would never understand, but possibly react in horror. Over the years, if we left our baby on the porch, we would occasionally get a river stone. I think I must have collected over seventy of them, which suggested to me that little Easton was being watched over by this hairy creature. I was to learn later that this creature is known as a Bigfoot. One day when Eastman was twenty years old, I told my wife about the strange hairy creature I had encountered that day, that had entered my dreams and left us a plethora of river stones. She said to me, Oh, that's my good friend Sequelia, which means sparrow. I'm amazed. The fact that she showed herself to you means she wanted you to meet her. She'd never just willingly show herself to someone. She's very evasive, very reticent. She must have liked you. She always looked in on Easton from time to time, you know, when he was growing up. She'd leave her calling card behind, 
a little stone. I'm sure you've seen we've got seventy of them over there. She's got superhuman powers, you know. Telepathic communication, I think you call it. Why didn't you tell me, I asked my wife. I didn't think you would believe me, I said. Samantha's account. Of course, all the girls in my form at school were astounded when I announced my mother was pregnant. You've got to be kidding! She's so old, said my friend Penny. That's such a bummer, you poor, poor thing. You have my deepest sympathy, she says, pulling a sympathetic face and blowing a balloon of bubblegum. You're going to be stuck with helping your mother. You know, with dirty diapers, stuff like that. As long as it's not you having the baby and your mum's not covering up on your behalf, says my friend Wendy, looking at me suspiciously. You're not suddenly going to leave school, are you, for six months and reappear again? And this time plumper than you were when you left? Of course not. I'm not like that. My mother is genuinely pregnant. Do you think she's going to force you to babysit for her? asked Penny. It'll be so annoying if you can't come with us out on a Saturday evening. My friend's reactions to my mother's announcement made me all the more certain that my mother having a baby had to be the most catastrophic thing that had happened in our household. One day I returned home to find my mother having a weep. What's wrong, Mum? No, it's just my friends. They didn't believe I was pregnant. They thought I was covering up for you. They thought you were the one that was really pregnant and that I was wearing a prosthesis. Do you know how insulted I was by that? The nerve of it. I told them that you've never even had a boyfriend and even if you did have one, you're a very good girl. I'm sorry, Mum. That must have been horrible for you. Yes, it was. I was so frustrated. Do you know I actually opened up my buttons to show them my bump, that it was real? Do you know they're appalled I'm pregnant? They kept going on and on about how women shouldn't be having babies at my time in life. Well, what do they know, Mum? Who knows, maybe they're a wee bit jealous. Oh, I doubt that, said my mother. I think they feel sorry for me. Suffice to say, when my little brother Eastman was born, all my previous reservations went whispering out of the window, never to be heard from again. My little brother was so incredibly cute, with a large mop of black hair and the biggest blue eyes I've ever seen. He was always chuckling. I found myself, rather than finding it a chore looking after my baby brother, it became an absolute pleasure. I didn't even mind changing his diapers. One day, while my mother was doing some grocery shopping in town, I took little Eastman for a walk in my mother's pram. Who should I see? My secret crush, my heartthrob, Nathan Douglas, whom had never given me the time of day in his life. When he saw me walking down the street with a pram, my heart almost missed a beat. I was absolutely gutted. Nathan had seen me like this. He would now never see me as girlfriend material, as images of me as a mother before my time would surely remove any romantic blooms from ever budding between the two of us. Who was I kidding? Nathan Douglas was the most sought-after boy in town. He could have any girl he wanted. Why would he ever pick me? He ran hurriedly over to me and asked me if he could look at the baby. I watched him lean over the pram. His face was glowing. It was animated. What's his name? He asks me. Eastman, I said. Interesting name. I kind of like it. It's got a nice ring to it, hasn't it? My heart was flapping in my chest. This was the first time Nathan Douglas had ever looked directly at me. In the past, I could have jumped before his face with a large sign on my T-shirt saying, Look at me! And he wouldn't have even observed me for a single second. Nathan had acknowledged me. And would you have believed it? It had been my little baby brother who had been the drawing card. That was the last thing I would have ever envisaged. Wasn't life really funny? Do you mind if I hold him? Nathan asked me. Of course not, I say, suppressing a delighted smile. Baby Eastman liked Nathan and began to gurgle with delight as Nathan rocked him in his arms. You're so lucky to have a baby, brother. When I get married one day, I'm going to have at least eight kids of my own. My eyes grew round when he said this as he looked at me earnestly through his blue eyes. Well, what will you do if your wife doesn't like the idea of having so many kids? Let's just say, eight kids is quite a handful. He looked at me and grinned. Are you for real? Any woman I marry will be easily persuaded to have eight children. How can you be so sure? 
You seem so confident that she'll agree to this arrangement. But look around you. People these days are having less children, as they did in the thirties, let me tell you. Believe me, Samantha, I can be very persuasive if I want to be. I knew when I told my friends that Nathan Douglas had approached me in the street, they would be green with envy, and possibly offer to take little Eastman around town in the hopes of being noticed by the likes of Nathan Douglas. Let's just say there weren't many young girls around who did not find Nathan rather irresistible. But the most attractive thing about him was he was completely oblivious to his attractiveness, and that is what made him so much more likable. Who would have thought that eight years later that Nathan and I would be walking down the aisle and would go on to have eight young children of our own? He was right about one thing, though. He could be very, very persuasive. And as for the Bigfoot that my parents encountered, my little brother Eastman, who was not so little any more, definitely has fleeting memories of a hairy lady visiting him when he was young. I never personally encountered the Bigfoot like my parents did, but one day when Nathan was driving me back home in the late evening, I think it must have been about twelve o'clock at night, we saw a large hairy creature standing in the road with a human face. Nathan Wheeler Douglas, the full name of my husband, stopped the car and said, Bloody hell, what is that? The creature was ginormous, with an incredibly benevolent human face, overlong arms, covered in long flowing dark hair. She stood there for a moment, allowing the headlights to fully take in her entire image. We got the sense she wanted to be seen by us. At the time we had no idea what she was, but I'll never forget her very kind eyes. They were beautiful. She turned around, gave us a nod, and glided away. Nathan looked at me and said, Did that really happen? I said to him, Sure, it did. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.